Radha Kunja Bihari Gopi Jana Bala Bagiri Varanari Yasoda Nandana Praja Jana Ranjana Yamuna Sida Banachari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Jaya Vishnupad Paramahansa Paramahansa Kachara Sotara Sotashi Shima Divine Grace Esi Bhakti Vedanta Swami Shila Prabhupada Ki Iskan Bibidi Vandacharya Shila Prabhupada Ki Jayam Vishnupad Paramahansa Padavajakacharya Stavtadas of the Shishimana's Divine Grace Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Goswami Maharaj Ki Ananta Gauri Vaishnavinda Ki Namacharya Shlahadidas Thakur Ki Prem Sekaho Shikrishna Jaitanya Prabhu Nichananda Shri Advaita Gadadar Shri Vasari Gauda Bhakti Vrinda Ki Shri Shri Radha Krishna Gau Gopina Shamakami Radha Kinyan Jiri Gavadan Ki Vrindavan Dham Ki Nabhadeep Mayapur Dham Ki Ganga Jamuna Mai Ki Lakshmi Devi Maharani Ki Nita Bhakta Vrinda Ki Nam Sankirtana Ki Brihat Madanga Ki All glories to the assembled devotees. All glories to the assembled devotees. All glories to the assembled devotees. All glories to Shishi Guru and Garanga. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. <clears throat> so reading from the Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 9, Chapter 6, Text 49. Sakadachat Upasina. Sakadachat Upasina. Atma panavam atmana. Atma panavam atmana. The darsha bahor chacharo. The darsha ba. The darsha bahor chacharo. Mina Sangha Samutitam Mina Sangha Samutitam Sakadachet Upasina Atma Panavam Atmana Dadasha Baho Chacharyo Mina Sangha Samutitam Others.
uh, Vaishnavis. Sobri Muni, Kadachit, one day, Upasina, sitting down, Atma Apanavam, degrading oneself from the platform of tapasya, Atmana, self caused, Dadarsha, observed, Bah. Bahu Chacharya Sobri Muni. Kind of read that wrong. It's Bahu Richa Acharya, but anyway. Who was expert in chanting mantras. Mina Sangha. The sexual affairs of fish. Samutitam. Caused by this incident. Translation and purport by His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. Thereafter, one day while Sobhari Muni, who is expert in chanting mantras, was sitting in a secluded place, he thought to himself about the cause of his fall down, which was simply that he had associated himself with the sexual affairs of the fish. Purport. Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur remarks that Sobari Muni had fallen from his austerity because of Vaishnava Aparad. The history is that when Garuda wanted to eat fish, Sobari Muni unnecessarily gave the fish shelter under his care because Garuda's, plan for eating, for, because Garuda's plans for eating were disappointed, Sobari Muni certainly committed a great offense to a Vaishnava. Because of this Vaishnav Aparad, an offense at the lotus feet of a Vaishnav, Sobri Muni fell from his exalted position of mystic tapasya. One should not, therefore, impede the activities of a Vaishnava. This is the lesson we must learn from this incident concerning Sobari Muni. Om Aginatim Ananda Shajananjana Shalakaya Chakshur Lamilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Manobhishtam Stapidam Yena Bhutale Swami Rupa Gadamayam Dadati Swapadantikam <clears throat> so here we have another great example of how somebody could be very powerful and yet be totally in illusion. So Brimuni, here's a great example of that. Look, let's think about what's going on here. So Brimuni, he's very powerful, no doubt, as Radnath Maharaj pointed out yesterday. Actually, he kind of spoke on this verse. He's <laughs> but anyway... Um, he's very powerful. He's meditating underwater, and, uh, which is, you know, it's got to be very difficult. And I think he was doing it for some extended period of time. When he comes out of the water, he's chanting some mantras, and as a result of chanting those mantras, he transforms his body, which was old and decrepit and, you know, not very attractive, into a young, strong, handsome man. And then... Uh, when he attracts all 50 of the uh, Maharaj Mandata's daughters to marry him, he, by chanting mantras, creates uh, residences, residential quarters for all of them, palaces with gardens and this and that and the other thing. You see? So he's powerful. No doubt about that. You know, he's powerful. But what's he trying to do? He's, so, he's powerful, but he's trying to curse. He's threatening and, and, and trying to you know, threatening and threatening to kill, basically, Lord Vishnu's bird carrier. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's, think about it. It's insanity. I mean, who does he think he is? He's, he's threatening to kill Lord Vishnu's bird carrier. That's crazy. Really. You know, I mean, that's like, he, and the thing is, he, he knows. I mean, it's, it's, it's not stated directly, very explicitly, but you know, he, when he does the cursing part, which is, comes up in the 10th canto, he doesn't go, he doesn't say, 
if that bird comes here again, he, I, I say with all my power, he will die, you know. No, he, he says the name Garuda. He knows who Garuda is. You know, I mean, he must. He's that advanced a yogi. He understands. He knows, who's, he knows who Garuda is. Um, actually, read on the margin is purport to this, uh, that text, that section of the Bhagavatam. He comments that he, you know, he makes that same point. Unfortunately, he doesn't uh, give a reference. He doesn't say where he, you know, that what Acharya says this, but he does say that here. Uh, you know, when Garuda came to the Yamuna, Sobhru Muni thought, although he may be a personal associate of the Supreme Lord, I will still curse him and even kill him if he disobeys my order. So he, yeah. He said, goes on to say, such an offensive attitude and against, against an exalted Vaishnava will certainly destroy one's auspicious position in life. As I said, unfortunately, he doesn't quote where, what Acharya, you know, where he got that information. But let's take it that he, he, he did understand that. So, um, yeah, that's a total illusion. Total illusion. He's, he's trying to discipline, uh, more than discipline, punish. Uh, the personal associate of Lord Vishnu, who he in, he in and of himself is very powerful. And, and what to speak of how powerful he is because of his relationship with Lord Vishnu. Uh, just to give some additional information about Garuda, because, you know, he's coming up here. Garuda is uh, Lord Vishnu's carrier, okay? And he is not Vishnu Tattva. Because, you know, there's not a lot. Sometimes devotees really are unclear about the identity of Garuda. Garuda is not Vishnu Tattva. That was established right here in Los Angeles. I, f I neglected to note the year uh, by Srila Prabhupada. When Narayan, our very own Narayan, asked Prabhupada that question, he asked him, is, Vishnu, is, is Garuda Vishnu Tattva? And Prabhupada said, no. He asked, he said, no, he's Jiva Tattva, but he is Nichasiddha. So Garuda is a uh, jiva, but he's Nichasiddha. He's actually a kinara, or kinara. I don't know whichever is the correct way to pronounce that. And uh, that murti that we have up there, which the men can see but the women can't, but probably you remember, it's actually pretty accurate for, according to the Bhagavatam because in the fourth canto, chapter 30, text 6 of the Srimad Bhagavatam, Prabhupada says in the purport, it says that... Um, Garuda appears to belong the, to the Kinara planet. The inhabitants in the Kinara planet, they all have the same features as Garuda. And he goes on to say, they're like human beings, but they have wings. So that's, if you look, you know, if you carefully look at that uh, Murti, that's, that's, they did a good job. They, you know, they followed the descriptions of the Bhagavatam anyway. Because the Garuda there is pretty human looking. I mean, he's got legs, which birds don't have. Well, not like that, anyway. And he's got, I mean, he looks like a human being, except for he has the wings and he has a, an eagle's uh, kind of nose. And actually, in another place, um, in one, another purport, Prabhupada refers to him as an aquiline bird. And I looked up aquiline, because <coughs> I didn't know that word in the dictionary, and it meant eagle-like. Appearing, yeah, and specifically referring to the nose, like a, an eagle-like nose. So that's a pretty accurate uh, depiction there of Garuda, that Morti. And um, <clears throat> yeah, so Garuda is very powerful. It's, uh, it's described elsewhere. Let's see if I can quickly find this reference here. Oh yeah, and one poor, poor Papa says, when Lord Vishnu descends from Vaikuntha. He's carried by Garuda. So in other words, Garuda's right there with him. You know, it's, uh, he's not just some bird of this material world. Lord Vishnu comes out of Vaikuntha. Garuda is in Vaikuntha with him, and then out he comes with uh, riding on Garuda. And uh, it's described how once Garuda snatched nectar from the mouth of Indra. He's so powerful. And, uh, oh, and even his, uh, his wings represent the two divisions of the Samaveda, the, which are Brihat and Ratantara. And there's one wing is one division of the Samaveda and the other wing is the other division of the Samaveda. And when he flaps his wings, that vibration is the Samavedas. So when Garuda's flying, 
he, that, he's chanting the Sama Vedas. The, he's create that, his wings flapping creates a vibration, which is the Sama Vedas. You know, this is the kind of personality Garuda is. And uh, it's also described when he's not on the job, he resides in a, in a place called Somali Dweep. Does anybody know where Somali Dweep is? Or oh, what Somali Dweep is? Any, let's see, any, we have any fifth canto? Okay, Somali Dweep, I know Drew DeCarma knows, but he doesn't count. Somali Dweep is um, the second of the ring-shaped islands around Jamba Dweep. If you remember from the fifth canto, it describes how Jamba Dweep is, you know, an island, and it's surrounded by an ocean, which is surrounded by a ring island, and which is surrounded by an ocean. I think there's six or seven of them. So Somali Dweep is the second one out. It's after Plaksha Dweep. And Garuda lives there, and he lives in a Somali tree, which is 800 feet, sorry, not 800 feet, 800 miles broad and 8,800 miles tall. So just to give you an idea, it's like the width of the tree that Garuda lives in is from like here to the, uh, the border of California and Oregon. That's about 800 miles. Actually, it's probably less. But, and uh, from here to London, that's about 8,800 miles approximately. So that's the size of the tree that Garuda lives in. And he offers prayers there. Um, once, just to give you another idea of his strength, on, on one occasion, um, when the demigods and the demons were trying to churn the ocean of milk, and they, you know, they were using um, Mount Meru as a, probably says pivot, but pivot, and it was really heavy, so it fell. And it describes in the Bhagavatam that a lot of the demons and a lot of the demigods got crushed. They got killed, even some of them. And, uh, but I think it was Lord Ajita at that time lifted it with one hand. He lifted it up out, and he revived those demigods and demons, back, brought them back to life. And he put it on the back of Garuda, who just flew it back to where it was going to be a, a put, placed upon, the, I think, the back of Korma, the, the, you know, the tortoise incarnation. Uh, you know, he was going to be used as a, like a base there. So, but he did that. So, he, he, you know, he's very strong as well. So anyway, so here is Sobari Muni, uh, you know, thinking he can curse Garuda or, you know, kill Garuda. It's really crazy. Actually, if you stop and think about it, he's even in bigger illusion than Dervasa Muni. Because Dervasa Muni, he was thinking, oh, I will discipline this Maharaj Ambrish. You know, I will show him something. I'll scare him or whatever his intention was. It doesn't really say he was, if you really read carefully in the Bhagavatam, it doesn't really say he was going to, he wanted to kill him. He just, I think he just wanted to shake him up a little bit, you know. But, um, okay, but, you know, Devasamuni, he, he, uh, he didn't see much, you know. Am Ambrish Maharaj was king. He was a humble Vaishnav. Okay, he was fasting, and he, he was fasting for some prolonged period of time, perhaps. But that was no big deal back in those days. I mean, you know, a lot of people fasted, and a lot of people fasted for a long time. And as he wasn't manifesting the symptoms of like a very, you know, great Vaishnav or a great powerful personality, aside from the fact that he was emperor of the, I don't know if it was the entire universe, or entire Bumandala or whatever. He was emperor. And um, so, you know, maybe he, you know, he didn't, it's possible that Devasamuni didn't, he couldn't, understand the greatness of Maharaj Ambrish, but Surabhaya Muni, how could he not understand the greatness? You know, he, he, he knows, he's cursing the, 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 bir the bird carrier of Lord Vishnu. And what to speak of how powerful Garuda is, I mean, you know, you're messing with Lord Vishnu's, you know, carrier there. I mean, just imagine if you had like a, you know, a horse or something like that, your favorite, favorite horse that you got around on, and, you know, it just, somebody's threatening, I'm going to kill your horse. You know, and somebody's much less powerful than you, much less powerful than your horse and much less powerful than you. And they're telling you, I'm going to, I'm going to, by the way, if your horse does this again, if he comes and passes urine in front of my house again or whatever, I'm going to kill him. Oh? You're going to, you're, you're, oh yeah? We'll see about that. And it's like, he's not, how could you, it's ridiculous. So anyway, that's, that's how much an illusion this uh, Sobari Muni is that he's thinking like that. And uh, it's interesting to note also here in the, uh, in, the, in the translation and also 
right throughout the, uh, the rest of the Bhagavatam too, there's no mention, there's no mention in the actual texts of uh, the reason why Sober and Muni fell down. Like, for instance, here in this today's translation, it goes here, he was, he was expert in chanting mantras, he was sitting in a secluded place, he thought to himself about the cause of his fall down. And here it is, and here's what he thought. And this is Sukadeva Goswami speaking, and you know, describing to us what Sobri Muni was reflecting, which was simply that he had associated himself with the sexual affairs of the fish. And of course, we know that there was more to it than that. We know that because right there in the purport, we have the commentary from Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur, which Prabhupada you know, tell, brings in, uh, that which states that it was due to Vaishnav. He, you know, he, fall, he fell from his austerity because of Vaishnav Aparad. But it's interesting that there's no place in the text of the Bhagavatam where that's directly stated. I, also, I went ahead to the 10th canto. It does mention about Sobari Muni uh, threatening to, you know, or cursing Garuda, but it doesn't mention this. It doesn't mention that was the cause of his fall down specifically. So that's something interesting and uh, one may wonder why, but I wasn't able to get any further than that. I tried to ask Archita, and I, he didn't know, and I tried to contact Mukunda Dat and couldn't. So that's kind of a little bit of a mystery there, why that's only coming out in the, in the commentaries, but not mentioned directly in the text. Um, so, but as Prabhupada points out here in the last sentence, he says, this is the lesson we must learn from this incident concerning Sobri Muni. In other words, that one should not, therefore impede the activities of a Vaishnava. Um, so it's, in other words, it's not a really good idea to try to impede the activities of a Vaishnava. It's just going to cause a lot of problems in one's life. And uh, there, this, is, you know, they're not, this is not the only example of that. As we, we just got finished, as I said, uh, mentioned the last few weeks going uh, over this whole pastime with Dervasa Muni and Maharaj Ambrish, we could see the trouble it caused him. It caused Dervasa Muni a lot of trouble, you know, trying to impede the activities of a Vaishnava. He almost, well, you, know, you could say he almost got killed. He certainly was harassed for an extended period of time because of that. And uh, another example is, uh, this is a really classic example, Jai and Vijay. You know, they really tried to literally impede the activities of a Vaishnava. You know, the four Kumaras were trying to, wanted to go see Lord Narayan and Vaikuntha, and they were approaching the gate, and there's Jai and Vijay, and they go, hey, where are you guys going? And they go, well, we're going to see Lord Vishnu, Lord Narayan, and, you know, the palace. They're like, okay. And they go, well, no, 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 wait, 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 hang on, hang on, hang on. How are you just kids? You know, we, we, you can't go there. And, hey, <laughs> chill out, you know. No, let's say, we all know the pastime. We studied that recently as well. Uh, the four Kamaras got offended. They got, you know, they got annoyed. And they, they actually, I think, if I remember correctly, the four Kamaras cursed them. They, they basically said, you're not fit to be here in the spiritual world. You, you know, you have this the wrong mentality, you know. And um, then Lord Vishnu appeared on the scene. It's described before it got even worse. And then Lord Vishnu gave them the choice if they wanted to take birth seven times as his devotees. They had to take birth. He's honoring the, the curse of the four Kumaras. And they gave him the choice whether they want to take birth seven times as devotees or three times as demons. And they thought about it and they decided, well, three times as demons because that way we'll get back here faster. So, but that was as a result of um, them impeding the activities of a Vaishnav. You know? Another example of <clears throat> that is... Uh, I think it's, his name was, was Ramachandra Puri or Ramachandra Khan. There was a that, that fellow who uh, was envious of Hari Das Thakur, and he, you know, the one who hired the prostitute to go out and uh, seduce Hari Das Thakur. It's described that in the, in the Chaitanya Charitamrita that, that later on the, uh, the Muslims came through his village and they, you know, he, he was like a, a Hindu and he had a Durga Mandap and they killed the cow on the Durga Mandap. In other words, they just desecrated his whole. They plundered and stole all his property and desecrated his altar and drove away, you know, him and his family members. And, and as they got ruined as a result of that. And uh, called Gopal Chapal, the one who tried to defame uh, Srivastaka. There's so many examples. One really great classic example of the, on this point 
and that and Prabhupada was you know had direct realization of this himself as Mr. Nair. Mr. Nair tried to impede the activities of a uh, Vaishnava, Srila Prabhupada. And he didn't, didn't work out too well for him. You know, he wasn't like uh, so much. He, it wasn't like he was um, against Vaishnavas. He was just, you know, a materialistic guy who was trying to cheat Prabhupada out of uh, money, as he did many other people. It's basically, they gave the devotees the land at a very cheap price, and he made a condition that you have to have the temple built by such and such time, otherwise you forfeit your deposit. You see? But Mr. Nair was connected. He was connected. He was, I think he was described he, at one time as the chief editor of the newspaper. He, you know, he was connected in different social circles. And he knew he could make it virtually impossible for the devotees to do that because they'd have to get this permit and that permit and this and that and the other thing. And you know, he was going to make it so that they couldn't do that and therefore they, would, you know, they wouldn't be able to fulfill the contract and they would forfeit the deposit. Anyway, but there were so many, you know, backs and forths on the whole thing. And finally, um, you know, at one point, you know, they, Prabhupada and Mr. Nair met. And uh, Prabhupada said, you know, Mr. Nair said, you think this is your land? You know, this isn't your land. And, and Prabhupada, anyway, when, I can't remember the, you know, the, 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 you know, who said what. But the gist of it was that, you know, Prabhupada said, okay, look, you want us off this land? Give us our money back. We'll leave, we'll leave you know, we'll leave them. 48 hours. Actually, we'll leave in 24 hours. Actually, we'll leave by the end of today. Just give us that money back, you know? And uh, Mr. Nair, he didn't say, okay, here's your money back. You know, he, uh, he wasn't willing because he, 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 his intention was to cheat the devotees. So in any event, that, it ended like that. And uh, some, I don't know how much later after that, but what happened was Mr. Nair died of a heart attack. And when they called and when they went and told Prabhupada, gave Prabhupada the news, Prabhupada said, actually, he said, actually, good. You know, I was praying. He, he was too much of a disturbance. I was praying to the Lord in the Shringadev to. Said, so what? He said, That's not Is that a fact? Yeah, so, you know, so there's a great example. He was trying to impede the activities of Vaishnava, and, um, you know, pro, at least from, you know, it's, Prabhupada, well, he basically almost directly said it. He got taken out by Krishna because of that. So not a good idea. And then on the other side of the, you know, story, um, it's a good idea to try to assist the activities of Vaishnav, Vaishnav Seva. Because we don't want to be a Vaishnav Aparati, or I don't know what the Sanskrit word is for a Vaishnav impeder, but what we do want to be is we want to be somebody who uh, assist the activities of Vaishnav. Just like we could see, one of the greatest offenses is to impede the activities of a Vaishnav. One of the greatest uh, beneficial things you could do is to try to assist the activities of Vaishnav. And the classic, classic example of that uh, is Narada Muni. Narada Muni was, as we all know, you know, the story was a, just a boy. He was, uh, his mother was a maid servant. She was like a keeper at an inn. And he had the opportunity to just serve these Bhakti Vedantas, great devotees, and, uh, and take the remnants of their food. And basically, he got the blessings. He got the blessings of these devotees, you know, staying at his mom's place, or the place she was kind of, you know, looking after during the rainy season. And as a result, um, at the end of that life, that, you know, as, Narada, as the boy Narada Muni, he was elevated to the, uh, the eternal spaceman, and, you know, of Nichasiddha devotee and greatest preacher perhaps in the Brahma Madhva Gaudiya Sampradaya, uh, you know, for all times. So that was as a result of his service, the service he performed to the, the Vaishnavas. Um, there's other examples. Actually, maybe, I think we've got a couple minutes. If anybody could think of any. I, the only other example I was able to think of off the top of my head was that, that uh, Devananda Pandit, he was reciting the Bhagavatam. And, but he was doing it with a slight, this is Chaitanya Lila, and a slight impersonal kind of a, a take on it. And uh, he was actually offensive, I believe it was, to Gadadhar Pandit. Uh, in any event, but somehow or another, he developed a friendship with Vakeshvara Pandit. And uh, he appreciated Vakeshvara Pandit and served him and like that. And because of that, he, he got the mercy. He, you know, he got uh, freed from his offenses and elevated. Of course, and another example is all of us. <laughs> you know, we are at least 
you know, a lot of us anyway, coming from just very ordinary materialistic backgrounds, but we got the good fortune to serve Srila Prabhupada, to try to do something to assist Srila Prabhupada. And as a result of that, we've been saved from just being out there, you know, one of the gross materialistic people out there, and we're, here we are engaged in devotional service and being given an opportunity to you know, perfect our lives and go back home, back to Godhead. So, uh, basic idea, once again, is that uh, one should not, therefore, impede the activities of a Vaishnava. The Papa says, this is the lesson we must learn from this incident concerning Sobri Muni. Uh, I, I, I just, just one more thing, and then I'll, that'll be it. Um, just, if you do, uh, though, find yourself in a situation where your activities are being impeded, uh, there is in the Ancha Lila, uh, chapter 3, um, Prabhupada gives a nice remedy, a nice recommendation as to a remedy. He says, um, it's, it's found in the, uh, <clears throat> the purport to this verse, Hi Goshai Kori Charanavandan, Jaha Hoite Bignana Shabishta Paran, Shirup Shisanatan Bata Raghunath, Shijiva Gopala Bata Dasa Raghunath. He says, uh, the translation is Krishna's Kavaraj Goswami is saying, I pray to the lotus feet of the six Goswamis, Srila Rupa Goswami, Sanatan Goswami, Sri Raghunath Bhatta Goswami, Sri Raghunath Das Goswami, Sri Jiva Goswami, and Sri Gopapata Goswami, so that all my impediments to writing this literature will be annihilated and my real desire will be fulfilled. And Prabhupada says in the purport, he says, it's not amazing that people who are trying to spread the Krishna conscious movement will be, uh, you know, confronted with many impediments, but with people who are like pigs. He says, but, he says, but, you know, but basically his, his suggestion is that if we take shelter of the lotus feet of the six Goswamis and pray for their mercy, then all, all impediments will be annihilated. And the transcendental desire for devotional service to the Supreme Lord will be fulfilled. So that's something we could all do. If you're feeling you're getting impediments, Pray to the, adhere to the lotus feet of the six Goswamis, which I guess we're already doing by, you know, following Prabhupada's instructions and chanting and so forth and so on, and pray for their mercy. And according to Prabhupada, all impediments will be annihilated and the transcendental desire for devotional service to the Supreme Lord will be fulfilled. So that's something we can do. So once again, concluding that it's not a good idea to try to impede the activities of Vaishnava, and, you know, that goes, therefore, without... Uh, goes without saying that the opposite of that, it, it is a good idea. It is a good idea to try to assist the activities of a Vaishnava. Uh, that's the, you know, probably the, the first one is the quickest way to mess up your whole life, and the, and the latter is the, the quickest way and the most effective way to, you know, improve your life and get, get things a lot better. So I'll stop there, and uh, anybody has any questions or comments? That's the first hand I saw go up, so... Actually, they'll send you a microphone. Sometimes, um, I know myself, I experience this when I'm uh, cultivating people and they don't really understand devotees or their motivations. You know, like Mr. Nair, he, was, he cheated the devotees. So uh, when we preach to people, sometimes I find that they're very critical of the devotees just out of ignorance. And sometimes that upsets me because, you know, devotee, we shouldn't hear blasphemy of other Vaishnavas. So what would you do in that particular situation? Let's say someone's like putting down the devotees and you're cultivating them at the same time, but you also want to clarify devotees are not like that, but they don't really, really understand devotees. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's a difficult situation. Well, if I was in that situation, I get in that situation a lot because, you know, you, you meet people out on Sankatan and they have a, a, you know, a bad impression about devotees. Most of the time it is based on ignorance. They just, uh, a lot of times they don't even really know who, who we really are or they don't know, you know, they haven't done their homework. But I give them the benefit of the doubt. I give them like, I give them one time around. In other words, I let them say what they want to say to it, you know, to a certain extent, without, unless they're getting really grossly blasphemous. 
And then I try to very nicely point out to him that, well, actually, it's really not like that. I mean, the fact of the matter is, and I explain to him what's really going on. And if they come around, you know, if they respond to that, wonderful, then I can continue talking to them. And if not, I just, okay, okay, well, thank you very much. It was nice meeting you, and off I go, you know. If it's somebody you're in a more long-term relationship with, I would adopt the same sort of policy and principle in the sense that make an attempt to, you know, explain it to them so that they can understand things properly in the proper perspective. And if they don't respond to that, then you have to, uh, you know, make a decision. And probably that decision should be to have, you know, distance yourself from them to a certain, to the, you know, to the appropriate degree. Yeah. Archie de Pabu. Thank you, Prabhu, for a very nice class of very clear points, especially this point that Prabhu made about not impeding Vaishnavas. But this can be and has been used against ISKCON regularly because people trot out, here is a Vaishnava. We all agree, so many people agree here is a great Vaishnava. Literally, you should give him your institution. You don't even allow him to come here and speak. What is wrong with you people? This is Vaishnava Puran. So how do you respond to that? We know how Prabhupada responded when he was here, but how do you respond to that? Because it happens regularly. People are saying that you ISKCON people, you're offenders. Here's a great Vaishnava that so many people agree on. He's a great Vaishnava, and he, you won't even let him speak in your institution. Hmm. Well, you know, we have uh, certain standards. Um, not, not standards of... Standards in the sense of this, we have a certain siddhanta. And uh, so we have to be, it's the, the duty of the administrators to make sure that who's ever sitting in this seat is, can represent that siddhanta almost perfectly. I mean, almost, you know, without mistake. And if there is some, uh, you know, question that that person might not do that, then that's a good reason to deny that person the opportunity to speak. They have to be able to, you know, say what, give us, present the same siddhanta that Prabhupada gave us and, you know, with the same emphasis, everything. Otherwise, it's, it's, we're doing a disservice to our spiritual master by allowing that person to speak. Yeah. I'll give you a practical example. In 2008, I was in Zurich, Switzerland. So I come to the temple and there's this Indian gentleman um, wearing saffron, long beard, and he's sitting and he's giving the class, Bhagavatam class. So I listened for a while. And then afterwards, I politely inquired, who is this person? And the devotees told me, well, he, he's from Vrindavan. And when he was a boy, he met Prabhupada. And, he, you know, he's really favorable to ISKCON. And they go, they go on and on and on. About. But after hearing what I heard, I knew this person is not coming in our line. So I contacted the GBCs and told them what was going on. And they came down heavy on the temple president and the other devotees. And they got mad at me. <laughs> they got mad at me for, for straightening them out that this person was not up to the standard of speaking in an Iskand temple. They got mad. Yeah, no, you did but, right. but this is Prabhupada's mood. I mean, I know strictly from Prabhupada himself. Even his own god brother, Ban Maharaj, when he wanted to travel, Prabhupada sent word, don't allow him to speak in our temples. Don't allow him to speak in our temples. So following Prabhupada's mood, like you said, we have to be very careful who we allow to sit on the Vyasa. Not that because so many people agree that this person is a great Vaishnava, that we should have let them in the door and they can say anything they want. Yeah, what to speak of it? The extreme examples, which, you know, are a little easier to deal with. I mean, because, you know, Sanat Goswami says, a Vaishnava, Atma Kod, Gyanam, Putam, Harikatam, Ritam, Shravanam, what is it? Shravanam, Kartas. <clears throat> yeah. You know, that you can't hear Krishna Kata from somebody who's not a Vaishnava, not a Vaishnava in good standing because it's like milk touched by the lips of a serpent. But aside from that point, that, I mean, even more recently, even more recently, like, I don't remember how many years ago it was, there was you know, one Vaishnava who recently passed away and we we denied him the opportunity to speak here in New Dwarka because, you know, for that reason, it's, it's very, it's a very, and Prabhupada, went, while he was present here, there was example, I think Guru Das, I can't remember the whole pastime, but there was one occasion where Guru Das allowed somebody to speak and Prabhupada became very upset. So it's, you know, it's a very delicate thing. The person has to be spot on. Otherwise, they, you know, they could speak, they could associate with the devotees and express their opinions, ca you know, casually like that. But if you're going to sit here, it's a responsibility of the person who's sitting here to represent this, you know, the Brahma Madhva Gaudiya 
Sampradaya Siddhanta as given to us by Srila Prabhupada. That's the responsibility of the person who's sitting in this seat. Not to, you can't, you know, give your own ideas, your own philosophy or anything like that. And it's the responsibility of the, the administrators, the people who, you know, to make sure that's what happens. Yep. Okay, I'm going to walk to Prabhu. Yeah. <coughs> Uh, first, I just want to say that uh, thank you very much for the class and also for your last point. I think you pretty much said it completely that Srila Prabhupada presented the Gaudiya Vaishnav understanding as he understood it from Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati and Bhakti Vinod Thakur. Uh, that we have a certain, as you said, Siddhanta, we have certain procedures, we have certain standards. So all those things have to be met, and if they're not met, they cause confusion. These discrepancies cause confusion, uncertainties, and doubts in the minds especially of newer people who have not developed their faith and have not read enough of Srila Prabhupada's books. So what you said is perfectly uh, uh, correct, 100%, and some of the examples that Archita gave were also very, very useful. So I, I wanted to, to simply say that uh, I agree with it 100%, but that was only one of the things that I wanted to say. Uh, and these are minor points. You had mentioned that the, the four Kumaras were Vaishnavas. Uh, it is my understanding that at the time that they were presenting themselves, uh, they were what they call Brahmavadis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, and, that's cool. yeah, Okay. <laughs> so they were Brahmavadis, but when Lord Vishnu came out and he had these Tulsi uh, wrapped around his feet and the fragrance coming from the Tulsi plants reached the nose of the four Kumaras, it was at that moment that a transformation took place. It went into their nostrils, it went to their brain, it went to their heart, and they immediately looked at the Lord and all they could do is feel love for him. And they wanted to worship him. And, and I they, have a question for you. Uh, well, I'm finished. Okay. And, they, and they felt the, uh, <laughs> the superiority of what they were feeling at that moment in comparison to what they were feeling in the Brahmavadi uh, uh, infinite light, which is a peaceful bliss, but it's not a dynamic bliss mm -hmm. as they themselves were experiencing. But that was just one of the points, and I'll come. Well, let me. I want, I want to ask you a question on that on point. On this point, okay. Yeah. So, I agree with you. I think at that point, when they went to visit, they were Brahmavadis. So my question is: so they weren't devotees at that point. Why were they going to visit Lord Narayan or Lord Vishnu? Uh, my, my understanding, and I don't know if you'll find this in the scripture, but it is a curiosity. Okay. Nothing more than curiosity. Uh, w w devotees go to different temples when some uh, great Vaishnava comes, and even if they don't know anything about him, uh, they'll uh, just curiosity. And sometimes the devotee might even go to hear a Mayavadi. They shouldn't, but they will just out of curiosity. So this curiosity is there. It's a part of our nature. And it's my understanding that <coughs> they obviously had heard a lot about Lord Vishnu, enough to pique their curiosity, enough to want to see him and visit him. And uh, they were, uh, as you said, very upset when they were they got through six gates, but on the seventh gate, mm -hmm. they were stopped. This was all a pastime of the Lord. He, it was a setup completely. Because right. when Lord Vishnu comes out, his final conclusion or statement is that uh, this is all, quote, my arrangement. You're getting cursed and uh, so forth and so on. He says, mm -hmm. it just didn't happen because they lost it. It was my arrangement. Why? Because right. I want to come down to the material world and I want to fight with uh, some demons who are my devotees because who else should I give that opportunity to? And therefore, they were chosen. It was actually a benediction. I mean, to fight with the Lord is the greatest of benediction, to get the hands of the Lord on. It's like when Kali was putting his feet, uh, excuse me, when the Lord was putting his feet on Kali's head, uh, that was the greatest of benediction, even though there was anger and there was fight and all of these other things. But that wasn't what, uh, does that answer your point? Uh, yeah, that's okay. Okay. We have to uh, but the further, other thing, do further uh, research I, uh, to verify that, but that, that's, that's okay. I mean, it's sense. a minor point, but the fact of the matter is, is that they, they be, it was a, but it's a great point from the point of view of, Prabhupada brings out this point over and over of how the Brahmavadis, Mayavadis can even be transformed just by the fragrance of the Tulsi flower, which are so potent with uh, spirituality of a devotional nature. <clears throat> the other point was, uh, you had mentioned at the early part of the talk that uh, there was no statement that uh, Sobri Muni knew that the eagle or the bird was, uh, was Garuda. 
And uh, based on what you read uh, and on the translation there, uh, it, he wouldn't actually know it because his statement was that um, if uh, this person uh, is he knew, a... He knew his uh, name. He referred he said, to him by although, name. Although, the word starts out with, with, although he may be a great devotee, even if so, I will still curse him. Now, although uh, he may be is a supposition. It's not a statement of fact. Mm -hmm. It's a supposed, if he is, then I still curse him. But if it's a fact, then I know he's Garuda, and I don't care, and I will curse him. So you don't have that there, you see. Now, when uh, you, see, you mentioned about Kaliya finding out about Garuda, that happens much later on, you see. That's later, because what happens is Kali founds out, uh, then when he knew that Garuda was cursed, if he goes to that lake, the Yamuna Lake, then what will happen is that uh, he'll die. So yeah, that no, I didn't mention that. Hmm? I, I, didn't, I didn't talk at all about Kalia. I didn't mention anything about No, Kalea. you didn't mention Kalia, but you said that, it, it, I thought you had mentioned that point Just about... Just Sobu Muni and Garuda, I didn't... Uh, yesterday, Radnath Maharaj was oh, talking okay. about Kalia. Well, anyway, I wanted to clear that up, that... Uh, uh, that, that uh, the, the Kalia going to the, uh, that uh, Yamuna Lake happens f long after this particular pastime. Mm -hmm. That's all. Okay. Um, you know, actually, the Kirtan went 10 minutes late, so up till this point, I'm actually okay because it's 10 minutes over the thing. Okay, but it uh, looks like everybody's had enough, so we'll, we'll stop there. Thank you very much. Kantar Shumad Bhagavatam Kijai, Shura Prabhupada Kijai.